Good morning. Welcome to Saving Grace Church. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Joe, one of the pastors here, and uh, thanks for coming this morning. If you didn't have a chance to to find a Connect card if you're a guest and take one out to the Welcome Center, um, you can do so after the the church service today. The the whole purpose there is if you want to get more connected or uh, get more information about the church, uh, the Connect card's the the way to to start. And so you can fill that out, and then we have a small gift for you um, out in the lobby. So we are just glad that you are here. And if you're watching online, you can um, scan the QR code and do the same thing. And if you really want the, the gift, swing by the church and we will give it to you. Um, If you are newer to the church and you want to find out more about um, who we are as a church, who are the the leaders, what do we believe, um, Saving Grace 101 is the the class for you. And and that is starting this Thursday, June 2nd. Um, We we have this course called Saving Grace 101. It's six weeks long and uh, it's taught by all of the the pastors. So all five of us will will have a a time where we, we teach. And it's, it's in a member's home. So the idea is that by the end of the class, you'll get to interact with all the, the pastors here and you at least meet um, six more families in the church as well. So uh, if you have questions about that, you can come see me after the break or after church or go out to the lobby. Um, but really would encourage you to, to check that class out and sign up. So that's every Thursday beginning June 2nd at 7 p.m. Uh, you may have seen the table out in the lobby with a whole bunch of sign-up sheets. That's for youth camp. So you do not have to be a parent or have teenagers to sign up. We need help in a variety of ways for youth camp that's coming up in a few weeks, which will be on June 20th through the 25th, the, the week of June 20th through the 25th. So uh, please check that out after church today and sign up for youth camp. Um, there's a whole variety of ways that you can sign up from kitchen help to to clean up, to working with the games, um, to taking photography, if you are good with tech, tech help. There's just a a wide variety. So I'm sure there's a place for you there. And the last one, just a quick reminder, if you haven't grabbed a baby bottle yet, you can grab that. Um, All money um, collected goes to Life Choices. And the the final baby, baby bottle is due back June 12th. Sometimes they get lost, truth be told. Um, I, hand, I was the first one this year to hand it in because we found one in our house from last year that was already filled up. So sometimes that happens. But Life Choices really appreciates everyone participating. So if you have a Bible, we're going to jump into the, the sermon today. And we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And let's pray before we jump in. Father, thank you for a beautiful sunny day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we pray we would encounter the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit through your word today. And we pray that we would be different because of these memorable and crystal clear words that are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I ask for your help in preaching your word, and we ask this in your name. Amen. So this is continuing our series on spiritual gifts. If you remember, uh, the Apostle Paul started the subject in chapter 12, verse 1, with the phrase, now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. And so we've been going through the subject of spiritual gifts, and chapter 13 is right in the middle of that subject, and he will continue the topic through chapter 14. Chapter 13, especially the first seven verses, is really interesting because he doesn't really mention um, too much about spiritual gifts. Uh, and, and it's extremely instructive because what we're going to see is there is something that matters more than spiritual gifts. So let me ask you a couple questions to get your, your mind working. How do you know if God is at work in a local church? How do you know? So if a blind person could suddenly see, is that God working in a church? I think so. If somebody experiences a great miracle of physical healing. Maybe they were deaf and now they could hear. Is that God at work? Um, If every single member is 
using their gifts in, in, in just great activity, both in the gathered Sunday morning church, but also throughout the week. If we followed every single person that comes to church here and we see them thriving in their gifts, is that God at work in the church? I think so. Or think about it from this angle. Maybe some of you are looking for a church. What would you say is the most important thing in a local church? Here's some things that, that might be on your list to determine if a church is healthy and thriving. Maybe it's a vibrant children's ministry. Maybe it's strategic leadership. Maybe it's faithful Bible preaching. Maybe it's sound doctrine and theology. Maybe it's faithful godly leaders. Maybe it's people that are radically generous with their money, possession, and time. Maybe it's a a church that's just all sold out for missions, for world missions, and they're willing to die for the name of Jesus. Maybe it's a church that has all the powerful manifestations of the spiritual gifts that are described in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. All of those things can be really good things. And the Apostle Paul is gonna mention some of those, but there's one thing that is more important to God than all of those good things. And that's what we're going to look at today. The key ingredient in a local church, and all those other things are really good things, is love. Is love. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, if you don't have this one key ingredient, you have nothing that is pleasing to the Lord. These are not my words. These are God's words. So, look at 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 1 and following. Eventually I'll explain why we have flowers on stage, why I have a random book here and a symbol sitting to my left. Um, This is the fifth Sunday, so I knew there would be kids present with us. Hi, kids. And um, we're going to do some somewhat uh, fun stuff to, to hopefully bring some of the truths out of this passage even more clearly. So, Uh, Look at verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Hence the cymbal on the floor. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, all your possessions, if I deliver my body to be burned, you become a martyr, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now he's going to describe what love is. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. See, the Apostle Paul is getting at our heart motive here. See, in the church in Corinth, there were all kinds of issues And most of them were heart-related issues. So they were having arrogant and proud attitudes about some of the the more spectacular gifted people were very proud and arrogant about it. And some that didn't have those kind of more outward gifts um, were also seemed to be struggling. And, And on top of that, the church was fighting with one another and they were dividing over all kinds of things. And the Apostle Paul is trying to cut through all that and saying, here's what you need to focus on. You can have all those incredible things, but if you do not genuinely love one another, you have nothing. So this passage, particularly the second half of the passage, may have been read at your wedding, and that's fine. Don't feel bad about that. Um, or, or maybe you're planning a wedding and you have it on, on the list to be read. That's fine, because it's true. No matter what. But the immediate context of that love passage is church life. It's the use of spiritual gifts. It's not the marriage passage. It's a passage about 
how church members should relate to one another, and specifically in the use of spiritual gifts. If you've used it, it's fine. Don't worry about it at all. It's true. But the context is everything. And sometimes this this is one of those verses that often is read and displayed way out of context. And so we want to pull it back into the context because in its context, we're going to see why it is such a critical local church um, section of the Bible. So love is the key ingredient. The title of this sermon is Motives Matter More. Lots of stuff matters. Solid sound preaching matters. The pursuit of spiritual gifts matter. Um, People serving matters. But you, you take all that away. What matters most? A heart of love. Our motives matter most. So two people could be doing similar things, one for their own glory and fame, another for the glory of God and the good of others. And the Apostle Paul, writing to this local church in Corinth, knows there are some that are just out of whack in their motives. And so he's trying to bring some direction. So let me just read two foundational Bible verses about love. By this we know love. This is 1 John 3, 16. That he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. How do, how do we know what love is? We know what love is because what Jesus has done for us. Jesus, who's fully God, fully man, came to earth, lived a sinless life, and then was crucified on the cross as a substitute in our place. He died to pay the price for our sins, and he was perfect and absolutely innocent. And then he rose from the grave on the third day. That's what true love is. And that love from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, has nothing to do with how lovable we are. So by nature, we are like porcupines or skunks. So to hug us, we're like porcupines, and to to smell us, we stink, spiritually. And that's who God loves. He loves us so much that Jesus sacrificed himself for us. That love should be our motive for serving the Lord and using our gifts. We've been recipients of an undeserved love. We're to demonstrate an undeserved love. John 13, 34 says this. This is the mark. This should be the mark of God's people. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, not by our use of spiritual gifts, not by incredible preaching, not by any of the uh, outstanding children's ministry, not by anything we might think of other than this. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this must inform the subject of our use of spiritual gifts, of our desire to serve the Lord. We must do it out of a motive to love God and love others. So now we're going to jump into our passage. And the first point is this. It's going to sound negative, but I just took this as kind of a summary of the first three verses. We have nothing, are nothing, and gain nothing if we do not love one another. We have nothing, are nothing, and gain nothing if we do not love one another. You could have dynamic worship. The, the, the most gifted singers and musicians known on the face of the earth. But if their heart is not for the Lord and for others, we have nothing. Fortunately, we, we, our worship team, they, they love the Lord. They are committed to serving the Lord. The, this morning, we were led by our teen band. Our, and um, 
whether young or old, that, that one of the things we want to emphasize is whether you're on stage or on the receiving end during worship where you're participating as a member of the congregation, we're, we're doing it to love the Lord and, and serve others. And it's a response to being recipients of his love. So we have nothing, are nothing, gain nothing if we do not love one another. I got that all from verses one through three. Look, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, so I have the gift of tongues that um, Paul has been talking about, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So if I, if I have a pronounced gift of prophecy, if I have incredible faith in God for all kinds of situations and circumstances, so much so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Nothing. So he's really digging at this subject. So on the negative end, we have nothing, are nothing, and gain nothing if we do not love one another. The opposite is also true. If we are serving the Lord with a desire to please him and do good to others, it is really pleasing to the Lord. This is why we have our flowers today. So one of the ways, I'm very visual, one of the ways to think of it is when our motives are right, it's like um, the fragrance of a flower. So if you could, if, don't come up here, but if you were up here, you could smell the flowers and they're, they smell good. That's what it's like when we're serving the Lord with right motives. It is pleasing to the Lord. Um, maybe flowers are not your thing, but if you drive all throughout the, the countryside right now, you can smell very fragrant smells. And I, I like the smells and, and they smell really good. And that's what it's like when we're serving the Lord with a, a proper motive. Maybe that's not your thing. Think of chocolate chip cookies baking in the oven. It's a pleasing smell. That is what it's like when people interact with Christians that genuinely love the Lord and love one another. I mean, think about it in your, your own mind, your own experience. If you interacted with someone who was very articulate, spoke in perfect grammar, but was not very loving or kind, so that's person A. And then person B speaks in broken English, vocabulary is very limited, but they are so big hearted and loving. Who would you rather interact with? It's not that complicated. We want to be with the more loving people. So one of the things I, I like to do this time of year is I ride bicycles a lot. So when I'm riding bicycles in the countryside, I smell all the, the great smelling flowers. However, um, another reality to living in a ball, uh, fallen and broken world is there are other smells on the roadside. So last week, I was riding my bike last Saturday morning and it was a it was just like a a roadkill buffet i mean it was it was like squirrels and rabbits and chip, chipmunks and one of the things and deer and and if a deer is very puffed up when you're you're riding by what i do is i hold my breath and pedal fast so that i get by the the smell but that's what it's like when we're we're serving the lord with motives that are for ourselves. It's, a, it's like a stench. But So we get our minds around it. I brought something so that you get the point. And the goal is to make this memorable. If, uh, if you have a weak stomach, I am sorry. So let me put my glasses on too. Do not want my eyes to burn. And let me get my work gloves on here. So I obviously don't have a deer in the bag. Because that, that would empty out the room. <laughs> but the point is, when you're around roadkill, it is like once it's in the hot sun like yesterday, it is just terrible. Terrible. So I double bagged it, just actually triple bagged it. Okay. So front row or second row, I'm sorry. Um, 
Now, who thinks I'm really going to pull out roadkill here? <laughs> you have no idea. Well, if I had roadkill, I'd actually be gagging. So, look at that. Oh. So, there were some dead rabbits, I think. So, I brought a family with me. These guys all survived. Look at that. And I think I got a little guy in here somewhere, too. It's a little harder with the gloves on. There he is, or there she is. There you go. So obviously this is not roadkill. But if it was roadkill, one, I would like have lost my mind to bring roadkill in here and have all the gross stuff. Um, but the point is, when we are living for ourselves and our own glory, it is like that. It is, it is a repulsive stench to the Lord. It, it brings out the gag reflex for not just the Lord, but for God's people. I mean, think about this. If you've been on a soccer team before in your life, raise your hand if you've ever been on a soccer team. So especially when um, you start in the, the really young ages, oftentimes there is one or two um, children that are just kind of athletically ahead of the rest. And they just dominate. And so basically you have a, a team of people that watch the one person score all the goals and steal the soccer ball from the, the team when they're on defense. And so you run back and forth. And if you're not that person, you're actually not really playing the game. You think you're playing the game, but you're just kind of running up and down because one person has taken over everything. Well, that's, that's a, when somebody is not a team player, this is kind of the idea Paul's getting at, that when you're doing things for your own glory or fame, and reputation rather than for the Lord. That, that's what you're like. Versus any, any of you, I know a number of us have coached things in the past. Any coach would take less talented athletes who are committed to the, the team concept way over one super gifted person. And if you think you wouldn't do that, Try coaching the opposite, and then you'll, you'll change your mind. Because it, it just spoils the whole thing. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. We have nothing, are nothing, and gain nothing if we do not love one another. So the use of spectacular supernatural gifts are hollow and empty without love. They, they are hollow and empty. He says something really interesting here. Look at verse one. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Not that I sound like a noisy gong. Oh, what's this? Or a clanging cymbal. But I am that. So I've been practicing this this morning. So this is what we're like. And... Harder than it looks. Um, so the interesting thing about this passage isn't that we sound like that, but we are that. We are that. So when we are living for ourselves and our own interests, we don't just occasionally sound like this. We actually are this. And this is not pleasant, uh, especially when I'm hitting it. Um, That's what we're, we become. And so motives matter. So imagine if there's, a, there's two churches. One has just really gifted people in all kinds of areas that are self-centered and living for their own glory. This is what the church is like. And so to interact, it's just this loud, obnoxious sound versus you have a church that has maybe less pronounced gifts, not maybe on the same degree, but there is a real heart for the Lord and for one another. Oh, does that please the Lord? Oh, is that like these flowers to the Lord? Just a fragrance that is pleasing to the Lord. That is the aim. Now, all of us are going to be a mixture of these things, and, and so we want to keep walking humbly. And when, when sin is exposed, we own it and confess it and turn from it. But 
God is very concerned about the motives of our hearts. Look at verse two. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, so as to remove mountains, but have no love, I'm nothing. So it's an indictment by God if we have these great gifts, but we're not doing it for the Lord. Another category he addresses is radical generosity and self-sacrifice. Look at verse three. If I give away all that I have, so you sell your home, you sell your car, you sell your bicycle, you sell your computer, you sell your video game systems, you sell everything that you have and give it away to the poor, but your motive isn't love, the Bible says, Paul says here, I gain nothing. You gain nothing. And probably the most shocking one in this verse is if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. If I will sacrifice myself, but not in a motive to bring honor and glory to the Lord or to um, do it out of love for others, I absolutely gain nothing. So he says we have nothing, are nothing, and gain nothing if we do not love one another. So this is a huge deal to the Lord. So what do we do? Like maybe we're feeling bad. Like, okay, sometimes I'm like that symbol. Sometimes I'm like roadkill. Uh, What do we do? Well, he's going to help us to know where we're aiming. And what do we do? We, We own it. We confess it. We turn from it. We ask our friends to pray for us, encourage us. And then we ask for the grace of God to do what he says in verses four through seven, which brings us to the second point. We honor Jesus and strengthen the church when we are motivated by his love. We honor Jesus, strengthen the church when we are motivated by by his love. What he's going to do here in verses four through seven, he's actually going to describe love more than he's going to define it. It's a little bit of definition, but it's much more of a description. So if you're asking the question, what is this kind of love like? What should it look like at Saving Grace Church? What should it look like at whatever church you are a member of? Paul's going to tell us this is what it should look like. And remember the context is serving the Lord using our gifts and abilities that he has given us. This is what it should look like. Verse four, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is the description. This is what we should be praying for, that we are like as Christians, as those who have been saved by Jesus. So ask yourself some of these questions. We're going to slow down and kind of walk through this. Are you patient with others? Are you patient with others in the church? I think often we go to uh, family relationships, brothers and sisters, like biological, or um, mom and dad, or husband and wife, and that you should be patient there, and that's totally fine to, to apply this to that. But the primary application is, are you patient with one another in the church? One of the the cool things and challenging things about this particular local church is we are a non-denominational church. So what that means, if you've been around for a while, we, we have people from all kinds of different streams of Protestant Christianity, which I think is beautiful. But with that comes different um, convictions about a bunch of different subjects and different things that, that um, depending on your convictions, you think should be 
uh, more at the forefront than others. And so it's a great opportunity for every one of us to be patient with one another. So are you patient with those who are not like you, who have different convictions on certain subjects than you do? Are you kind to others, particularly kind to those who are not like you? Are you humble, particularly if you have more public gifts that often get celebrated? Are you walking humbly? But you don't have to have those gifts to be proud. The human heart is is slipperier than that. So you can have very behind-the-scenes gifts and also feel really puffed up. So are you humble? Are you easily irritated? Are you like when you get poison ivy on your skin and it's just itchy and red and just growing? Is that, is that how you feel towards certain fellow Christians? If that's the case, you're, you're human, you're like everyone else that we all know. But that's the old us, not the new us. And so we want to own that and ask the Lord to give us the affection of Jesus for one another. Now when you're doing stuff like this, this wouldn't be helpful afterwards. Maybe you feel convicted, a person came to mind, don't say their name. But don't go to them after church and say, you know what, I feel really irritated every time I see you. <laughs> that, that is not the love that the Apostle Paul is aiming at. So don't do that, but, but do work with the Lord and in your own heart. See, we honor Jesus and strengthen the church when we are motivated by his love. This love is patient and kind. It's a love that does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. We don't want to celebrate when someone else fails or has consequences of their own um, sins or, or bad decisions. See, love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. If you're going to be in any local church for a significant amount of time, you're going to have to have grace from the Lord to bear with one another. It's true no matter where you go if it's a church that has people in it. Um, Because we're not all real huggable at times, right? And we have to be different by the power of the Holy Spirit because we've received this love that we do not deserve. And that love should emanate from us to others. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I hope you're getting more convinced that love matters more than your use and pursuit of spiritual gifts. That doesn't mean they're unimportant. We're spending a whole series on the spiritual gifts, but our motives matter most. Raise your hand if you checked your car oil by yourself in the last month. I knew you would, Albert. Tim, not surprising. Don, not surprising. (laughs) Yeah, all the usual suspects as I look around the room. Better question. Raise your hand if you haven't. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so the purpose there, you're checking it for a couple things. The oil level, make sure that's good. And if it's clean or, or dirty. And um, the purpose of that is so that your engine has oil in it. Love is like the oil in a car engine. No oil in an engine, and the engine does not work. If you want to ruin your car, never check the oil. Never change the oil, never um, fill the, the oil in your car. See, oil is essential to a car running. Love is essential for a church to please the Lord and make an impact in its community. They're, they're really no different. My, my grandfather, his name, I call him Poppy Jean, uh, he's 90 years old. It's in great physical shape. Uh, does push-ups. He lifts weights. He's just in phenomenal um, shape. But he has some knee issues. So every few months, he has these cortisone shots in his knees that make his knees move better and feel better. 
when that infuses into his knee, he can suddenly do things that he couldn't prior to going to the doctor. Well, love is the same way. And the the best way we're going to grow in loving one another and having our motives right is to be amazed and marvel often at the love of God in Christ. The most loving Christians are going to be those that are most blown away by the mercy and grace of God. So it's almost opposite. So rather than spending hours and hours checking the oil of your heart for the rest of the day, if you spend a little bit of time maybe checking the oil, oh, it is really dirty, or oh, it's kind of non-existent, uh, then go right to the Lord who is merciful and gracious and gaze at the truth of that reality of how awesome his unconditional love has been to you. And what you'll find, you check that, that oil level again, you'll, you'll find that the love of Christ is, is welling up in your heart because you were so blown away by how loving he has been towards you. So we want to check our motives at times, but we want to gaze at Jesus far more than we look inside ourselves. And so the prayer for us as we're continuing through the spiritual gift section is that we would take these words to heart. We would make it our aim to obey verses 4 through 7 and really live that day after day. And when we fail, we run to Jesus who is merciful, who cleanses us, who forgives us. And as we do that, I guarantee as we grow in loving one another, we will impact many, many, many more people for Jesus. Because God's love will compel people. God's love will draw people. Just like you and I were drawn to the Lord. So let's pray. If you guys could stand, the band can come back up. Holy Spirit, we ask for two things here. We ask for conviction where appropriate. And we ask for a greater awareness of Jesus' love specifically poured out on us. And may that awareness make us more patient with one another, more forbearing. Would it produce hum- more, a greater degree of humility in us? And may it bring you much glory. And we we pray. We we know there are way more people in our region that don't know you than do know you. And we want to impact them for your glory. And would you use us in increasing ways in every local church in our area that loves Jesus. May you use us all to bring the gospel to those who don't yet know you. And we will give you all the glory. We ask this in your name. Amen.